afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick Anderson with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. Um, good morning to anybody joining us from Central Time. Um, again, we are here today to talk about scale insects and hemlock woolly adelgid management. So we have a twofer this afternoon um, on the tree health care front. Uh, real quick, just some housekeeping things. If, um, if you did not put in your, um, your ISA certification number when signing up for this email, then please go ahead and do that right now. You can click over there on the right-hand side of your screen, most likely, is a uh, little box with a, something in there that says questions. You can click right in there and put in your, um, your again, your ISA um, ID so you can get CUs for this webinar today. So isn't that great? Okay. Well, let's get started. Uh, again, just real quick introduction. If you are not familiar with Rainbow, uh, which many of you probably are since you are here today, we, of course, we were founded in 1976 and grew from just doing um, preventative Dutch elm disease treatment to being the largest full tree care, full-scale tree care company in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area. Uh, in 1997, uh, the part of the company that I do work for, the Rainbow Scientific Advancements part of the company got started. And what we do is we bring products and protocols to market so that arborists and landscape managers can provide predictable results um, responsibly uh, to tree and shrub care out there in the world. Uh, we do an extensive amount of research and development, both internally as well as in cooperation with a lot of great research institutions um, and other uh, large companies and municipalities. And just last year alone, we did 106 research trials on various plant health care, tree and shrub related things. So today, though, what we're going to be speaking about is um, scale insects and hemlock woolly adelgid. And I also did fail to mention that if any time you do have questions, please feel free to put your questions into that question box there over probably on the right-hand side of your screen there. Um, and then we will address any questions at the end of the, um, the presentation here today. So again, we're talking about scale insects and hemlock woolly adelgid today. Um, that's pretty apt because they are closely related, believe it or not. So with scale insects, we're going to learn what are scale insects, um, why identification is important when we're talking about scale insects, and then we'll look at the life cycle and treatment strategy for three common occurring scale insects in the eastern part of the United States. Um, we'll then talk about hemlock woolly adelgid. We'll get a brief history of hemlock woolly adelgid in the eastern United States. Uh, we'll talk why um, hemlock woolly adelgid is an important pest. Um, and again, we'll look at some treatment strategies again for hemlock woolly adelgid there. So first, what are scales? Um, we've had a few talks on scales earlier this year. So in case you missed any of those, which they're all great, you can go to our website, treecarescience.com, and find all our past recorded webinars. But they're animals, they are arthropods, and they are insects. And they're in the order uh, hemiptera there. And so scales are very closely related to uh, several other tree pests and shrub pests. Uh, and you can see here a few that we've listed, leafhoppers, true bugs, cicadas, aphids, adelgids and also white flies. So a lot of these pests that we're dealing with are closely related um, in that they are, most of them have these piercing, sucking mouth parts, and that's a unique characteristic of the order um, of Eutera there, is that they have these piercing, sucking mouth parts, and they remove either fluid from the vascular system of the tree, or they feed within cells individually to damage cells. Um, scales specifically are unique in the fact that they are highly modified insects and the adult females usually lack wings or legs or anything like that, antennae, uh, once they mature. And we'll talk uh, in depth here, life cycle of some of these scales, specifically three of these common scale insects here in just a little while. Um, there are 30 or so scale insect families. Um, and you know these uh, taxonomists are always liking to change things around on us. but about 30 different scale insect families. And the reason why they're important to us, of course, is they can infect a plant's health. Uh, some can just do uh, strictly aesthetic damage to the plant, uh, maybe yellowing out the leaves a little bit, maybe causing some honeydew and sooty mold to grow on that honeydew. Um, some can do more serious damage, though, by decreasing photosynthetic activity. Um, over 30 scale species can transmit different types of viruses. And as we all know, there's no cure for a virus once it's in a plant. 
Uh, and of course, you know, these can cause great economic losses um, for, especially if we have a, a large specimen tree that has been affected by a scale insect that can be uh, pretty damaging. Uh, and it can cause a lot of problems in our landscapes, as, as we know, if, if we have tried to manage scale insects in the past. But scales are not all bad. They do serve a purpose um, in the world. And there are several species, multiple species of other arthropods that use scales as a feed source. Um, a lot of times here, of course, these, um, these soft scales produce a lot of honeydew, which things like this little ant here um, likes to go and feed on, of course, keep his queen happy and keep that brood going. So scales are important in the world. They're not all bad. And we as humans have been using scales actually for centuries. Um, first discovered that we could use them for dyes, for really fancy clothing, for old aristocracy type people. Um, and we also use them in many foods and cosmetics. And uh, Starbucks actually was going to use, it says beetle extract, but Starbucks was going to use the extract of a particular scale insect uh, as a uh, food coloring in some of their beverages. And, and that met with some uh, mixed reviews, so they, they decided not to do that. But if we start kind of dialing down on some of these different scale insect pests, you know, we mentioned we have about 30 or so families, really about four or so families that impact arborists throughout the United States, specifically is what we're talking about here. And really, when we look at that, there's really only like two insect families that are impacting arborists for the most part um, on the East Coast, especially in the Northeastern uh, Mid-Atlantic parts of the United States. And so we have soft scales as picture up in the upper right hand corner here of a uh, cottony camellia scale. We have armored scales, which would be something like T scale here on the camellia. And then we have the felty scales, which are very closely related to these soft scales. This is um, azalea uh, bark scale, which some of you may be familiar with. And then of course we have mealy bugs, which again, if you're working in greenhouses or again, if you get more into a uh, subtropical part of the United States, you start running into these guys more and more often. But Today, we're going to really be talking about just these, these soft scales and these armored scales. Um, and if we look more closely at these guys, so soft scale is, if we compare them, if we're talking in comparison to an armored scale, it's generally going to be a little bit larger. They're going to, it can be up to a quarter of an inch uh, long. Um, some can be even larger, like for instance, uh, magnolia scale, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, can get to be pretty big. Um, they're often smooth or cottony. They're usually round. And you can see here, this is a photo of of what a typical soft scale would look like. This is Lacanium scale. This is on a pin oak here. You can see the way they're kind of rounded. They're large, relatively speaking. Um, they feed within the phloem. They feed within the vascular bundles. We'll look at that here in a second. And that's an important distinguishing factor when we talk about scale insect management. Um, the, now, the soft scales, uh, again, this is going to be a distinction compared to the armored scales. Is when it comes to egg laying, they can lay thousands of eggs. So their populations can increase really, really quickly. Uh, one of the reasons why these guys can be so damaging is you can start out with just a few scales on a tree and within a year or so end up with a whole lot of scales on a tree, which could really lead to some um, dramatic health and appearance results on these plants. Um, these guys generally have one generation a year, and this is kind of like a typical for a soft scale, and there's always an exception to every rule, of course. But if you look at a typical life cycle for a soft scale, they, of course, start out as eggs. Those eggs are going to hatch into this crawler phase, which is important to keep in mind because it's this crawler phase. It's this immature nymph that hatches out of the egg where most of our treatments are going to be targeting. Uh, again, if we're, especially when we start talking about foliar sprays, we're going to attack these crawlers because, as you can see, these adults form these waxy coatings here. Um, and it can be difficult to get products down to, to kill these, um, in this case, these females. But these little immature crawlers that are walking around that are very, very small, some microscopic, um, they don't have that covering. They're very easy to kill, both with our foliar sprays as well as our systemic products, because, of course, smaller things are generally going to be easier to, to kill than, than larger things. Uh, and now these, these crawlers, they may... They may settle down and never move again. In some cases, like with canium scale, they'll crawl out to the leaves. They'll settle down. They'll feed there all summer. And then they'll pick back up in the fall. And they will settle back down on a twig where they will lose their legs and um, antennae and spend the winter there. And then again, begin that whole um, series or this whole life cycle again next year. And so as I mentioned here, 
one of the key distinguishing things between a soft scale and armored scale is the way they feed. And I love this. I wish I could take credit for this slide. We got this from um, Dr. Joe Boggs. And uh, so if we look at a soft scale, they're going to hang out. They're going to crawl out onto a leaf and they're going to inject their uh, mouth parts into this vascular bundle, into this phloem where they're picking up sugars, carbohydrates, and amino acids, and those types of things. Um, and if we think about when we're using systemic products, specifically like a metacloprid or Zytec, that stuff is going up in that vascular bundle. So systemics work very, very well. All of our systemic products, for the most part, work very well on soft scales, with a few exceptions, because there's an exception to every rule. But we have, uh, again, the insect is feeding right in this vascular bundle where we are putting systemic products, so it's pretty easy to kill them. But now the other part here, again, is from a, a, a diagnostic standpoint, is they're passively feeding here. So it's not like they're taking a sip of, uh, of this vascular uh, bundle phloem and, and, um, and swallowing it and then kind of taking another sip. They're passively feeding, and because of that, we get a lot of honeydew excretions because anything they can't digest while they're feeding in there basically just comes right back out the other side of them. And of course, that is a sugary substance, which then that sooty mold wants to grow on. So if you walk up to a tree and you see that it has a scale insect and you see that it's covered in uh, honeydew and sooty mold, that is likely going to be a soft scale. Now, if we start to start showing the differences between those armored scales and those soft scales, our soft scales are generally going to be a little bit smaller and they're generally going to be elongate. Now, of course, there's exceptions to all those rules, but generally, again, we're going to have a, a scale insect that is less than an eighth of an inch long. They form this waxy shell that actually, if you were to pull this shell off of an armored scale, that scale would stay attached to the tree, whereas with a soft scale, the soft scale is attached to their shell or their test, um, and that soft scale would come off of the tree. Uh, so those are some distinguishing factors there. They don't produce honeydew, and we'll see that in a second. They're feeding within the, the mesophilic cells there. Um, they're not actually feeding within that vascular bundle, so they don't create honeydew like a soft scale. So again, if you were to walk up to a tree and you see it has scale insects, but you're not seeing that honeydew or that sooty mold, that is a, a distinction there that you have an armored scale insect. They generally lay less eggs as well. So while we can definitely see explosions of armored scale populations, it usually takes a little bit longer than with our soft scale populations. Um, these guys too, uh, with our soft scales, as we mentioned, they generally have um, one generation a year and they pretty hatch, hatch, they can hatch over a few weeks, but it's, it's usually not over months. Whereas with our armored scale insects, they typically will have either one, more than one generation a year, or two, they could have a very extended crawler phase. So they could crawl over the course of months instead of the course of weeks. Um, and this would be a typical um, life cycle again, where the females will overwinter, they'll mature, they'll lay eggs in the spring, and then you'll have one generation that's usually occurring early on in the spring, and then you'll have a second generation that's occurring usually later on in the summer. And again, you could have one to three generations. Again, depending upon where you are in the country, you could have continuous generations. Uh, as long as it's warm enough, that scale will continue to do this life cycle thing. And in those cases, we can see armor scales take off really, really quickly. And again, as we, if we look at where these scales are feeding, as I mentioned, they're feeding in this, this, um, this mesophilic cell area here. They're actually feeding inside of cell contents. So Again, if we're depending upon our systemic product, and I usually say what, I, what I'm really talking about here is with imidacloprid. Imidacloprid is very, very popular. Zytec is very popular. It's very effective on a lot of pests. It is not effective on armored scales because these armored scales are feeding out in here. So you would use, you need to use something like dinotefuran or Transtect um, to get out into these areas to get um, these plants, to get these um, critters and to actually cause mortality. And if we look at the symptoms here, again, we're not seeing, we're not seeing that hoodie, that sooty mold or that honeydew. What we are seeing is we're seeing this kind of, this coalescing chlorosis of dead and dying uh, cells here that can really um, be dramatic on a plant. And can, I mean, we're talking about losing a lot of photosynthetic area here. So um, we can really have a lot of damage uh, when armored scales are affecting plants. And as I said, imidacloprid is not going to be effective on armored scales. If you take nothing else away from our talk here today, 
If you have an armored scale, do not use them in a clipper on it because you will not get great results. Um, and I always show this here. Is, now, this is important, you know, as we just mentioned, is we have some distinguishing features here between these different scale tests. And we know for a fact that, you know, one is we're going to have to know their life cycle. So we're going to have to monitor and diagnose these scales if we're going to use fuller applications. Because as I mentioned, when we talk about spraying these pests, we're spraying the crawlers. That's where we're going to get our best bang for our buck. Likewise, monitoring and diagnosing because, you know, if we're going to use systemics, we have to make sure we're picking the correct systemic. And so I always present on this idea of the growing degree days and phenology model. So once you've identified what kind of scale you have, you want to be able to identify its life cycle and when those crawlers are going to come out. And we can use the growing degree day model, which of course growing degree days are a measure of heat accumulation used by horticulturalist gardeners and farmers to predict plant and animal development rates, um, such as the date a flower will bloom or the date and scale will crawl. And we, this is a, an ongoing measure throughout the year. And as we look here in a little while, we'll see different growing degree days and when these pests come out. And you calculate growing degree days by taking the high temperature of the day and the low temperature of the day. You get an average. And then we usually use a base of 50 degrees. So we subtract that and we count for the heat accumulation for the day. So if we were to take an example, if we had a 70 degree day, if we had a 70 degree high and a 50 degree low, and we got the average and we subtracted it from 50, that would be 10 growing degree days. If the same thing happened the very next day, then we would add that number together. We'd have 20 growing degree days. And then we would just kind of continue to monitor that throughout the year. And that's how we would figure out our growing degree days. And we'd be able to relate that to um, when specific uh, scale insects are different parts of their lifetime. We'll also talk about that with Hemlock Lee Delgit as well. We can also use phenology uh, to predict some of these things. And so phenology is the study of periodic plant and animal life cycle events and how they're influenced by season and interannual variations. And so basically this is the old coincide method. So people have been monitoring these for a long, long time and they realize that when certain plants come into flower or bloom, they coincide with certain pests becoming active. So I know that this is a, this here is a smoke bush that is in bloom and as a neat little trick with phenology, when smoke bush is in bloom, I could expect that Japanese um, maple scale crawlers um, will become active soon. So when I'm driving around in my truck and I see that these guys are blooming, I know I better go to my properties where I know I have Japanese maple scale and start scouting for the crawler so I can best make my applications. Now, again, we have a lot of different ways. When we talk about products and scales, we have a lot of different ways of killing these poor little things that are causing so much damage. Now, as I mentioned with our spray treatments, as you see here, we have a lot of different options on spray treatments here. But we're effective. We're only going to be effective on these crawlers. So that's why monitoring, diagnosing, and then using these kind of these growing degree day and phenology models to time our applications is going to be so important. Because if we're too late or we're too early with our foliar sprays, then we're not going to get the results that we want. And then we've wasted our money. We've wasted our clients' money. And of course, the plant is still being damaged by that pest. And so again, as I mentioned, there's a lot of different things we can use here. Some of the things that I think are really neat is this, this here, this um, pyripropacin is also sold as distance. It's an insect growth regulator. So if you spray these little insects with this particular product right there, they just, they just don't grow up. And so you break the life cycle by not allowing these guys to grow up. One other neat little thing that I learned earlier this year, I was um, at the uh, Indiana Arborist Association meeting in January, and I had the pleasure of hearing Dr. Cliff Zadoff speak. And he noticed in his trials that when he sprayed horticultural oil on armored scales, it was much more effective than spraying insecticidal soap and vice versa. When he sprayed insecticidal soap on soft scales, he found it was more effective than when he sprayed it on armored scales. And of course, we're talking about the crawlers here. And so if you're having difficulty managing certain scale insects with some of these traditional things like horticultural oil, which we still recommend, maybe it is a uh, time to switch it up. So if you are having trouble managing certain soft scales with horticultural oil, maybe try using insecticidal soap instead and vice versa. And again, we're talking about attacking these little crawlers here. 
When we talk about tree injection, we have some options as well. Of course, we can directly inject Zytec, 10% or imidacloprid. We can also directly inject uh, Lepitec, Acephate. And keep in mind, though, the Zytec is not going to be effective on our armored scale insects, whereas Lepitec would be effective both on soft and armored scale insects. And then finally, the soils application, which is probably one of the most popular ways um, to treat for scales, um, at least it's been in my experience. And here, of course, we have imidacloprid or Zytec, we have Dinotefrin or Transtec, and then we have, of course, our Lepitec product. I, again, if, if you remember nothing from any of this, the Zytec or imidacloprid will not be effective on these armored scales. So again, making sure you're monitoring, diagnosing the right pest and matching it to the right product is going to be super important here. And now, of course, we also have this really neat new way of applying dinotefrin or Transtec is that lower bark spray option. So in this case here, all we're doing is we're wetting the lower five feet of the trunk um, and a, the complete circumference of the lower trunk from five feet down to root flare, doing it at the appropriate rate, and we're getting phenomenal results with scale insect management. So if we take a quick look at some of these products and their efficacy, this is wax scale. This was down in Georgia. We can see here we have um, Transtec at different rates, we have Zytec at different rates, and this little B basically means that there was no statistical significance here, so these all worked very, very well compared to our untreated. So compared to our untreated, all these products work very well on soft scales like wax scale. This is um, some more efficacy data that we did just two years ago on gloomy scale, which is a type of armored scale. And what we have here is our basal bark spray and our soil injection. And we compare that to our untreated control. We're getting great efficacy with our Dinotefuran product, Transtech, on armored scales, which is really nice. And then here's some older piece of research. This was from the Morton Arboretum. And this is showing the using a soil drench of Lepitec, which is acephate on Euonymus scale, which is an armored scale and getting really great results when we look at our different rates versus our untreated control. So proof is in the pudding. We have a lot of great um, efficacy data on using these systemic products on, uh, on these scale insects, these different types of scale insects. So if we real quick, let's get into the field here and get a little practical with these things. Let's take a look at uh, several common scale insect pests of the, again, the Northeastern US. We have our one soft scale, magnolia scale, and then we have our two armored scales elongated hemlock scale, and then our white pernicola scale. Um, and then we also have white peach scale, which are very closely related, though slightly different. Um, but here, if we start at our magnolia scale, so magnolia scale is actually the largest scale uh, that we find in the US. It can get to be pretty large, as you can see here. You know, this is this fellow's finger, and this is the size of these scales. They can get to be pretty big. Um, they feed on primarily magnolias, of course, um, star magnolia, cucumber tree, saucer magnolia, as well as lilies. Um, they, now these can be very, as they are large, so they consume a lot of that uh, photosynthate material. So they can be pretty damaging to trees. Uh, they can kill trees, they can reduce the amount of foliage, they can reduce the amount of flower production. And one of the things that we see here too is that because they create so much honeydew, they attract a lot of stinging insects. So if you have clients who are sensitive to those types of things, these guys um, not only could be an issue for the tree, but if you have somebody again that's allergic to stinging insects, this could be an issue for them as well. Um, a pretty neat looking scale, all things considered. Now here's what's interesting. So we kind of talk, we talked earlier about you know the the typical scale life cycle. And, you know, for both our armored and soft scales, typically speaking, our first generations are going to be earlier on in the year. So our crawlers are going to come out early on in the year. And Nolia scale is the exception to the rule. If we look at when these crawlers start coming out, these crawlers coming, start coming out about 2,000 growing degree days. So depending upon where you are in the country, that's going to be more like late summer or early fall for um, treatment of the crawlers for these guys. So that's something to keep in mind with magnolia scale. So if you're monitoring and identifying magnolia scale, then what we're going to want to do is if we're targeting crawlers, we're not, if we spray in the spring uh, with the hopes of targeting crawlers, we're not going to have great efficacy. So we want to target again later on in the fall with things like maybe our horticultural oil, um, some of our synthetic pyrethroids, um, our insect growth regulator. And again, what did we learn earlier is that the soft scales seem to be um, 
they seem to be more sensitive to insecticidal soap. So maybe even insecticidal soap bringing this in here. Um, and then again, we can use some of our um, systemics applied at the correct time. So again, with our Zytec, we know it's going to take a while to make it up into the tree. So we want to apply far enough ahead to affect these guys. And then we can also try some of the, the traditional things of doing the horticultural oil uh, later on in the season there. Um, and try to kill anything overwintering by desiccating them and suffocating them out. Next, we have our first of our armored scale, so the elongated hemlock scale. So these guys, uh, these guys are kind of cryptic almost. They can be easily missed, especially in low populations, but of course they can uh, build up pretty quickly. And interestingly enough, as it plays into our next part of our talk, is that they can be found often in, in conjunction with um, hemlock woolly adelgid. And so again, these guys are an armored scale, so you're not going to see honeydew production with these guys. They affect not only hemlock, but as well as different fir species and spruce species. Um, and again, you will see just a general um, lack of vigor in the crown, some early needle drop, some um, poor needle color, and they can be pretty damaging as well. Um, so with their life cycle, these guys have two generations a year. Their first generation, as we said, armored scales generally will have more than one generation a year. That first generation is going to be beginning at about 272 growing degree days, so pretty early on in the year. The next generation is going to come out later on in the um, summertime there, about really about midsummer, about 1,300 growing degree days. So again, if we're going to use um, foliar applications here, then what we'd want to do is we'd want to target these uh, crawler emergence periods here. And again, we could use our insect growth regulators, which I really like. This is an armored scale, so that horticultural oil, again, targeting these guys would be a good idea. And again, Transtech, so again, we don't have Zytec listed here for this is, as this is an armored scale, but Transtech works very, very well on elongated hemlock scale. And um, this could be a good way to do it. Um, for treating these guys here. So, and of course, we also have our options of the, the late season horticultural oil sprays there as well. We move into our last scale insect. We have white prunicola scale. And so there's another closely related species, white peach scale. They are so closely related that we often um, treat them the same. They can be distinguished, you know, again, by a very skilled entomologist, but also um, their hosts. So white, white prunicola scale is said to only get on peach plum, cherry, mulberry, uh, lilac or privet, and probably a few others as well, depending upon where you are. These guys can cause significant branch dieback, and these can be these can result in um, plant death, especially if you have a smaller plant um, like one of these cherry laurels or something like that. They can develop in high populations very, very quickly, and again, I, I've seen them do substantial damage to the plant. These guys can be very difficult to control as they primarily feed on the bark and they don't or within the bark area or on the twigs and they don't feed within the leaves where again all of these systemic products they build up in the leaf and so if you have something that's feeding on the leaf they're very easy to control generally speaking assuming you're using the right product but these bark feeding species this is these become more difficult to control systemics because of where they're feeding and so again we want to time this um, with our foliar sprays, we want to time this at the crawler phase. So they start very early. Um, that first crawler phase starts around 145 growing degrees. It's very, very early in the season. Then they have another generation. Again, it's going to be about 107 to 1100 growing degree days, which would be, again, that kind of late spring, uh, mid summer, and then again, a late summer, about that 2000 growing degree day mark. So again, with these guys, it's not going to be a one spray and done for sure. You're going to want to definitely use um, all the tools you have in your toolbox here. Um, again, relying on the horticultural oils or again, pyrethroids as well as the insect growth regulators to really get these guys really knocked down this population. You know, these guys can be very difficult to control. Um, so again, it's very important that you are targeting them at the right time and using the correct products uh, to get these guys. Um, with that. And again, if you guys have any questions, please throw those into the question box and we will get those answered um, here in just a little while before we, or right after we get through the hemlock woolly adelgid part. 
So treatment failure. So I hear you know, my job, of course, is to do technical support. So I, no one ever really calls me up and says how great things are going. I always get the calls of why things aren't going well. Um, so things to keep in mind again for so treatment failure. One is um, you know make sure the life cycle is in sync with the uh, application method you are using. Um, you know the correct product is also um, you know important to keep in mind whether it's going to be a systemic product or a contact product. Um, the other thing too, of course, is we have uh, interesting life cycles here. We have life cycles that overlap. We have life cycles that um, are varied throughout the season. So it's usually not a one and done spray, especially with our armored scales. We might have to do several treatments to make sure that we're getting all these guys. If we're doing sprays, of course, coverage is going to be key. Um, as we mentioned before, incorrect pesticide selection. So making sure we are using the right chemistry for the right uh, insect. And then finally, of course, you know, weather events. And this is where using your growing degree in phenology is important is, you know, not every year is the same. If we look at kind of, you know, uh, let's see here, 145 growing degree days is not always, you know, that first day of April. So it's important to keep an eye on what the weather is actually doing to time these things correctly, because that's what they're going to be in sync with. So with that, we'll move into hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, a very interesting pest um, in the way it is, uh, its life cycle is, and the fact that it is so devastating to um, our eastern native eastern hemlock species. So again, we looked at this slide just a little while ago. What are scales? So scales and adelgids, again, they are in the same order here with these other critters, so they can be treated fairly much the same way. But if we look Real quick, just kind of rewind and think about why hemlock woolly adelgid is really important. It's because hemlock woolly adelgid is an invasive pest of eastern and Carolina hemlock. So we have two native hemlock species on the east coast. Um, you know, our, our eastern hemlock, which you think of, and then of course you have our little Carolina hemlocks. And so these guys provide a very niche um, type of life in the forests as they are shade tolerant species that produce these very dense shaded areas and if you've ever walked through a hemlock forest I mean it's just it's, it's a beautiful like mysterious place to be but they create these really niche ecosystems that then of course you know we have maybe thousands of different species whether it be insect whether it be fish like trout um, birds all these different things that really are relying upon the ecosystem of these forests so the, this um, these hemlock play a huge role in um, in how the the health overall of these forests and you know this metric here you know, eastern hemlock is home to over 400 arthropod species alone so if we just look at bugs on hemlocks and just the he bugs that live in hemlocks over 400 different species that are aligned specifically on hemlock and again that doesn't play into you know all these other things we just talked about with this this ecosystem type stuff. And if we look here at the range of eastern hemlock, it's pretty substantial. I mean, we have hemlocks as far south as Alabama and as far west here as Minnesota, uh, and smaller populations, of course. But um, this is, you know, you see here along this east, northeastern, mid-Atlantic area, this is where we have a lot of hemlock forests, and they play a great, great role um, in these things. Now, if we look at the history of hemlock woolly adelgid in the east coast, it was actually first detected in Richmond, Virginia, of all places, uh, back in 1951. And they've since traced this to, um, they believe this, this initial um, infestation originated from a population of hemlock woolly adelgid over there in Japan. And it really started picking up and spreading in the 1980s. And you can see here this kind of map here. Uh, over time, you know, we have these dark areas. This was the early infestations between 1968 and 1984. And then all of a sudden, it really starts moving here in the 80s. And then again, in the um, early 2000s and 90s, how we're spread. And if we look now at where we're at, this is a map from 2015. We have it spread all the way up to Maine. We have it spread, again, um, closing in on Alabama but here in Tennessee and Georgia as well. And then we had a, um, an outbreak out here in Western Michigan that was uh, said to have been eradicated. So thank goodness for that. But again, you see our native range, we see how far it can get. Um, these guys can be very, very serious. And again, because they kill these trees 
Um, that is the biggest problem is, is you know, these, there's no native pest to manage these guys. Uh, so when they get into our forested areas, they cause mortality. And over time, um, this is this can be a huge impact. And again, if, if you've not gone out into the Appalachian Mountains or some of these places have been in these, you know, large, huge, um, you know, hundreds, maybe thousand year old hemlocks are standing there dead. It's it's pretty dramatic to see. But again, so hemlock oil delgate is, is native um, out there in Asia. And so it can be found on all these different Asian species. Um, but again, it's, it doesn't kill them. And it, of course, it has to do likely with that, um, you know, that co-evolution there that we are all so familiar with, of, you know, growing, growing up with the same pest that doesn't seem to bother you as bad. Now, interestingly enough, there is a population of hemlock oil delgate that is well established here on our western coast and it is found to be uh, associated again with our three western species of hemlock but again it doesn't kill them um it's just kind of there in low populations like many pests are in native um, environments and so this was kind of news to people not too terribly long ago and with the um, the advent of all this dna um and testing and things like that we have since found that um, this little quote here, that there is no conclusive evidence for recent introduction of hemlock oil delgate into the Western North America. So this population of Western and Western North American is, um, is endemic. It, it can be thought of maybe almost as uh, native, uh, but it never made its way over to the East. And with this, this strange shipment of um, hemlock oil delgate from Japan over into Richmond, that's how it got to the East Coast. So Hemlock willow dodge is not necessarily invasive to the United States or North America, but it is to the eastern United States and North America. So I think that's pretty interesting. But if we look now into the, the biology of hemlock willow delgate, again, it, as I mentioned, they're very close related to scales and they behave very much like scales and the way that they uh, behave and the way the life cycles are. So these guys have two generations a year. Um, again, they're going to hatch from their eggs early on in the year, the 203 growing degree days. So they're very, very, they, they come out very, very early in the year. Uh, they go through several nymphal phases when they become an adult. And then, of course, that adult lays eggs. And then those eggs hatch, the crawlers come out. And then it's really interesting that the crawlers kind of just hang out during the hot summer months. They don't really, they're not really active in the hot summer months. And then as it begins to cool off, they become more active and they finish up their life cycle. So it's really, really interesting, their, um, their, uh, their life cycle there. And again, this would play into when we are treating. So, you know, if we we're gonna use fuller applications of things like horticultural oil, which horticultural oil works very, very well on these guys. But the thing is, of course, is it's the timing of it. And of course, some hemlocks can get to be, you know, several tens of feet tall. Um, you know, we have hemlocks that are probably approaching 100 feet tall. So spraying those could be, of course, uh, problematic. Um, but again, horticultural oil works very, very well to control these if you can get good coverage. And again, what we want to do though is we want to target these crawler phases. And then likewise, you know, in the summertime, when they're not moving around as much, we don't seem to get as good control as when they, again, in this fall area where they start moving around more um, and are more active as nymphs. So things to keep in mind for the treatment of these guys here. It's interesting to note too that they, um, the wing, some of these winged adults will fly off to spruce trees and um, they'll try to, they don't, their life cycle ends at that point. They'll get on that spruce tree and they'll feed. But um, again, the life cycle is cut off. They don't reproduce in the spruce tree. So it's only here in these hemlocks that they're going to reproduce. Uh, another thing to note is that generally speaking, in the southern U.S., you will get winter kill of hemlock oleodelgate up in the northern latitudes. But in the southern U.S., we don't receive those types of winters as much as we do in the northern U.S. So that is it a really big issue while we're worried here in the southeast United States when it comes to the movement of hemlock woolly adelgid and, and how bad it will end up being uh, again in states like South Carolina, Georgia, and uh, Alabama. And again, just up close of what these guys look like, of course, this is the where, the, where their namesake is from. They create this, this woolly material, this uh, waxy woolly material that they lay their eggs in and that protects the eggs. And then this is an early instar crawler. And again, if we're spraying, this is what we'd be targeting. And then this is what the settled down adults kind of look like right there. So 
very interesting little pest. And if we look at how it damages trees, again, you're going to have this look of a water stress, just a, uh, it, it looks like an environmentally stressed tree. Uh, we have defoliation, we have thinning of needles, we have yellowing of needles. And again, over time, these poor plants um, succumb and die. Um, so it's, um, it can be very dramatic in the woods. Um, but again, now in the landscape, these are one of these pests that I joke that if you stood there and you cursed at them long enough, they would probably die of hurt feelings. Um, in the landscape, so for our landscaped trees, these are very, very easy to control. Um, I mean, they're, they're very easy to control insects as long as you, of course, are taking the right precautions and, and choosing the right times of year and things like that. So while we can use foliar sprays, again, I would advocate for the horticultural oils um, on these guys because they work so well. Um, if you're, uh, again, but for larger trees, that can be hard to do. The systemics work extremely well um, on hemlock oleodelgin, specifically our neonicotinoids like imidacloprid or Zytec or dinotephrin and Transtec. They work phenomenally well, and they work well for a long period of time. Um, again, the hemlocks are a wind-pollinated species, so there's very low exposure to it. Of course, everyone is concerned with pollinators and their exposure to um, plant reproductive materials um, you know, after application. And so these guys are when pollinated, they're not relying upon pollinators um, for seed dispersal or excuse me, or for, for pollinating rather. Um, so again, we can feel fairly safe that when we apply these products, we're not doing, we're very, we're doing very little adverse damage to the ecosystem as a whole. So these work very, very well. If we look at metacloprid, this could be applied in the spring or fall. It takes about three months to build into adequate concentrations in the tree. And it can be effective for five to seven years. So we can protect trees for five to seven years with one application of Zytec and feel pretty comfortable about it. Um, if we're talking about that first application, this would be better for those light to moderate infestations. If we look at Dinotectoran, again, this can be uh, basically anytime the tree is active, so spring through early fall, we can apply Transtec. It'll take about two to three weeks to build up in adequate concentrations in the tree, and it'll be effective for one to two years. So we're going to get one to maybe two seasons of treatment with that, with this Transtech, um, and it is best for heavy infestation. So it's one of these things where if you're walking up to a tree that's heavily infested, you can apply the Transtech right away and then come back in a year or two and follow up with the metacloprid and get, again, almost seven years of efficacy out of that. So, again, these work super well. These hemlock willow dodges are very easy to treat as long as, you know, the tree, the site, what have you all are, are cooperating with us. And of course, with our transect, we have that, that bark spray option for these guys, which is also would be similar to our, our soil applied option here. So a couple different ways to treat for these guys. Very, um, again, be very effective in their treatments. So to wrap things up before we look at our questions here, again, scale insects and hemlock willow dodge have varied and interesting life cycles. Knowing the species of your scale is important for successful for a successful management protocol. And then, of course, choosing the right systemic product and application method can offer excellent long-term control of hemlock wood adelgid on, again, these landscape trees there. So and if you want to learn more, um, I have to say a lot of the information I presented from in our hemlock wood adelgid area, I got from a recent webinar on hemlock wood adelgid. Uh, that was broadcast through this forestrywebinars.net. This is an association of several institutions that um, focus on um, forest health. And so you can go to that forestrywebinars.net and you can look. There was, it was, I think, presented a month or two ago on hemlock woolly adelgid. And so you'll get a more in-depth look at hemlock woolly adelgid doing that webinar and there are other webinars as well. With that, that's my contact information. Everyone can feel free to contact me at any time. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you're interested in phenology and pests around the Charlotte, North Carolina area. And with that, let me just pop out these questions and see if we have any good questions here. Certainly, there's no such thing as a bad question. Um, so we have just one. Uh, and it is, is white pernicola scale found in the Northeast? Also, has it been documented in black cherry? So that's, those are both great questions. As far as I know, white pernicola scale is also in the Northeast. 
I don't know if it's been documented on Black Cherry. So, um, Craig, I will make sure um, to get back with you on that. Um, and that is right now our only question. And I can hold here for a few more moments uh, to see if there are any other questions. Um, as I said earlier, um, you can view this webinar and all of our other webinars at um, treecarescience.com. Go to education. Um, here is another question real quick. Is soft scales on maples, what's the best treatment? So um, and red maples specifically here. So soft scales on red maples. Um, you could do, so with the soft scale on the red maple, you could apply something again like TransTech after flowering because they are a, a species that attract pollinators. So after flowering, you could use TransTech. You'll get uh, almost full season long um, efficacy of TransTech in a tree. Um, but again, you're not going to get any carryover into the next year in red maple. So you won't have to worry about, um, again, those, those pollinators for next year. But that's very effective, the, the TransTech on things like, yeah, both cottony maple scale and cottony maple leaf scale that you'll find on a, a red maple. Um, and if you have any, other, any specific questions on that, Kevin, of course, always feel free to, to reach out. Yes, oh. Spelling of that. <laughs> um, I can uh, I can send you an email, Kevin, if that works for you. <laughs> no problem. Um, do we have any other questions? I'm happy to stay on for a few minutes. Can we have till one? It's 12.46. We were able to wrap up a little bit earlier. And if there is no questions, then of course you can always feel free to drop off. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. And again, check out the website to view web, uh, any webinars that you've been able to miss or have missed um, earlier on this year or in years past. All right, guys. So looks like we're good here with no more questions. I'm going to let you guys all go. Thank you so much for your attention today. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me or your local territory manager. And uh, everyone, have a great day and a great weekend. And we'll look forward to hearing from you soon.